I think very appealing, although speckled with some controversy. Mike Evans, A.J. Brown, the first two names there, you can throw T. Higgins in. We have three very different players here. Mike Evans, the veteran, the air yards guy, the touchdown guy, the player who now projects for maybe more volume than he's had in a long time with Chris Godwin recovering. You contrast that with A.J. Brown, the peak superstar, can do everything, but perhaps in a low-volume passing offense, so those two teams could be at opposite ends of the spectrum. And then with T. Higgins, we have this offense that wasn't as aggressive passing last year, but they were so explosive down the stretch, we expect them to go more in that direction. But he is a number two, right? And even if it's a, a 1A, 1B, these are high prices to pay for someone who is having to compete, not just with Jamar Chase, but also with Tyler Boyd. You don't buy that. You're just saying that to keep his price down. None of us is taking that. We're completely throwing that out. Anyone who listens to Stealing Bananas knows that was a complete lie. No one, no one, we don't care about who's the number one or the number two. T. Higgins has an, an incredible profile in his own right. This is a, a great passing offense. Sean just doesn't want to have to take T. Higgins in the third round or even in the second round if he gets too excited about him. But T. Higgins is a fine pick. A.J. Brown also a completely, I mean, I think he's an easy pick in the third round. It was going to be a little bit tougher if he was in the early second range around Diggs and around CeeDee Lamb. I think you can make a case that A.J. Brown should be in that range from a talent perspective. Certainly he's in that range. You just talked about Debo, all the things that he can do talent-wise. I think I can make the case that Tennessee has not necessarily gotten the most out of A.J. Brown and that there's a possibility that if Philadelphia, with all of the investments in their passing game over the last couple of years, with the Devonta Smith uh, draft pick and the trade for A.J. Brown, they're maybe ready to be a little bit pass heavier. They were extremely run heavy last year, but we talked on the show before about how a lot of that was just like one stretch of seven or so, six or seven games where they were they're, if you look at their pass rate over expected, they were at least 10 percentage points below expectation every single week for a stretch. It was something that was working for them, and they just rode it really, really hard. That's that's a huge shift towards the run. I mean, I think they – I remember, again, referring back to stealing signals from last year, I was kind of keeping a running tracker each week. Like, they've extended this streak now, another double-digit negative game. All of these games for this stretch were among the, like, 40 lowest games of any team for the whole year. They had like a five or six game window that every one of their games was in that, you know, most run heavy games for any team. Uh, but their whole season wasn't that way. They threw a little bit more early on. I think there's potential certainly for them to throw more this year. I think we should expect that as we kind of average out things and assume that they won't have this crazy run heavy stretch. And there's a there's potential, I think, for them to throw a lot more. Like if you want to talk about who could be the next sort of B Buffalo Bills the year they took off and were a really heavy first and ten passing team with Josh Allen. Look, we got you the weapons. Now we want to make you throw on every down. The Eagles are a team that could be that with Jalen Hurts. It would it's maybe not the most likely scenario, but um that would be, I think, very promising for AJ Brown coming from a team that has been running it heavy in their own right. So I don't think you can really knock Brown too much for expected volume concerns i think that's why he's being held back into the third round but evans is the one that i'm sort of out on here this is sort of the first guy that i don't really want to be drafting a lot of and it's because if godwin didn't tear his acl i would be telling a story that evans there's a lot of concerns his targets per out run last year were about two percentage points below his 2020 number which was already a career low by a couple percentage points so we're seeing this multiple year decline. He was at 17.5% of routes that he was targeted on prior to 2020, 2019 and back. He was at least 21% every year. And so 2020 he was around 19% and he's down to 17.5%. Last year, I mean, he still had the efficiency, but his yards per route run as well, which are heavily influenced by the targets per route run, a career low. He's getting up there in age a little bit. He's had some, you know, some injury stuff of his own. Definitely can maintain the high TD rate. Definitely still has Tom Brady throwing to him. My concern is when Chris Godwin comes back and works back into the flow of things, when you're talking about these best ball tournaments that most people are drafting right now, you want the guys you're drafting to be good late in the year. You know, our buddy Pete Overzet has talked about this a lot. I know he just released a video on YouTube that talks about how important week 17 is. I expect Chris Godwin to be 
back to full strength by week 17. Certainly not by week one to five or even eight necessarily, but by week 17. And the flip side of what I just said about Evans, yes, they had a lot of other weapons. They had Gronk, they had Antonio Brown these last couple of years, but Godwin actually set a career high in targets per out run last year. He's taking the step forward as he sort of enters his prime. He's obviously quite a few years younger. That's a dude that looks like if, if I didn't have Chris Godwin's injury in my mind, I would be arguing Godwin is stepping into his prime. Evans is exiting it. We're seeing a, a passing of the baton, and I would want to be way more on Chris Godwin. That doesn't mean Godwin's a clear target, but you do have this concern, at least I do, that for Evans, can he maintain it for a whole year, or are, are these multiple years of targets per out run decline indicative of him kind of being, you know, starting to, to – exit out of the prime of his career. When you talk about him in the third round, people are taking him in the early third round because of Godwin's injury. And I'm looking at it like, well, when Godwin comes back, this, this might not be good. And they've added Russell Gage, who isn't a star, but is someone who is going to vacuum up a lot of that vacated volume. And we talk a lot on the show about emphasizing the player's profile and their skill level, where they are, in terms of the age trajectory, as opposed to emphasizing the targets that look like they're available for week one in the passing game. You mentioned where he is in terms of drawing targets. An interesting thing that pops out when you look at sort of his career page in the NFL uh, player explorer is that he had three seasons in the first two thirds of his career where he went over 2,100 air yards the last two years with tom brady he's at 1327 and 1504 he plays in 16 games in both of those seasons his yards per reception falls the touchdowns are career highs in both of those years and i'm not saying fade the touchdown portion but the touchdown portion is going to be very important for him because the combination of where he is and where tom brady is does act as at least a mild limiting factor on this upside that he has or had as a vertical receiver. It's not quite the same. That doesn't mean that Mike Evans is no longer good. That's not the takeaway from what you're saying or from what I'm saying, but I I agree with you in that there are problems to the profile and those problems are going to be exaggerated at the most important time of the year. So there are some paths where you draft Mike Evans in this range and it it works out very nicely. I don't think this is a disastrous pick by any stretch. There are running backs you can select here. They're going to be far worse for your roster, but we like some of the younger, higher upside guys. Yeah. And I think you put that really well. We're not saying that Mike Evans is bad. I'm definitely not saying that. I think there's still arguments to take him. I just don't want to make that bet in the early third round. And it's very similar to a guy, the next guy, which is Keenan Allen. He's going wide receiver 12 in the later third round. Another guy whose targets per run have dropped a couple of times. We've talked about this earlier in the off season. But, um, or actually his yards per target, sort of his efficiency, he's been less explosive, not that he was ever the most explosive player, but looks like he's kind of getting up there in terms of whether he has the ability to be uh, at least a reasonably efficient player in, in, you know, after the target efficiency, as I like to call it, after he's earned the target. For multiple years in a row, he's up over eight. He's up over nine at his peak in terms of yards per target the last couple of years, 7.2, 7.6. And we saw a dip in his ability to earn targets last year down to still really good levels, but not elite levels, which is where he was usually sitting uh, as, you know, this more possession type receiver. And so he was down at 23% targets per out run. Uh, in 2021, he had been up over 25% in most of his best years, up at 26, sometimes at 27%. So another guy where, okay, if I got to pay a third round price, I don't want to start to see these kind of red flag concerns that maybe this player is on the back end of his career. On the flip side, the Chargers are such a fun offense, right? And I want to pull in Mike Evans here, or Mike Williams here as well, because he's going really high. I mean, I I don't love his price, but also if I'm not in on Keenan Allen, I kind of have to be in on Mike Williams, right? Because who else is going to catch the passes here? I don't think Josh Palmer is that great. We joke about Jalen Guyton fairly frequently. I don't want anything to do with him. And Justin Herbert looks like he is going to be a superstar. So how are you playing the Chargers? Well, I'm playing with Gerald Everett, which probably will be the wrong way, but it is an inexpensive way. 
And you do have to have some exposure, as you said, because Justin Herbert is so good. I like Williams' price a little bit better because you have more room to beat it. You have more room to be kind of wrong and have it not kill you. You also have that vertical ability and the touchdown ability. If we saw one of these guys really go off and have a massive season, it would probably the, be the lesser of the two in terms of cost. In that scenario, it becomes pretty straightforward. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that. So as we look towards the end of the third, we have Jalen Waddle, who was going you know, in the second round earlier in the offseason prior to the Tyree kill trade. Swing into the fourth. You have Deontay Johnson, Michael Pittman, DJ Moore. You have DK Metcalf going in the fourth. This is the range where it starts to thin out a little bit at receiver. I still really like Deontay Johnson's profile. I still want to have my exposure to Jalen Waddle. I'm not really sold on Michael Pittman. You guys know that I love DJ Moore, and I want, I mean, I'm going to probably wind up way too exposed to him because of sort of the names that come in after him. And I think there's reasons to be somewhat optimistic on Metcalf. But after this range, and this is the range where on our running back show, we're talking about, you know, J.K. Dobbins and Travis Etienne. After this range, you start to get into a pretty questionable round five for wide receiver strength relative to the last couple of years. Relative to 2021's round five wide receiver strength or 2020's round five wide receiver strength, certainly into round six. You know, you got Brandon Cooks in round six this year. You have Michael Thomas in round six. Round five, you have Allen Robinson. These are guys that are Older, certainly some some big time question marks in terms of what they still have in the tank. I mean, Amari Cooper's going in round five. I don't really want to be drafting any of those older players that I just mentioned. So, is this an area, this Waddle through Metcalf area, one that that we want to be targeting pretty consistently? I mean, how are you how are you playing this as we enter the running back dead zone? It definitely is one where I think we have to get some of these guys before we get into that round five range that can be tricky because there are some guys in round five, but there are also some landmines in round five. And you can find yourself in a draft where the players you wanted go ahead of you and then you're left staring at those landmines. It's a little bit easier in underdog because you can take these guys and then you could still select ETN or Dobbins after them if you wanted to take a shot in the dead zone at one of these fun running backs. We mentioned those guys as probably the only people we would be looking at in the dead zone at running back. Kind of my Cliff Notes version of these players that you just mentioned, what I feel like are the most relevant stats for me, Jalen Waddle, somebody who drew targets at an incredibly high rate last year for a rookie. Now they were underneath targets. I kind of like I'm going to have some Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is too good of a player to now that he's at the end of the second round to not have, right? You're getting that discount because he changed teams. You have to take that. But I think you can also take Waddle, who's been knocked down some by Hill's arrival. Two of the fastest players in the NFL may have some similarities there. Tyreek Hill, you have the uncertainty about how he does without Patrick Mahomes. If there's any question about that, or if that actually is a factor, then Waddle, who's the rising player and also this crazy athlete, might actually be the way to play that. You're getting a discount to find out Deontay Johnson, you know, 11 targets per game, right? So how can you really fade that too much in the fourth round? And that's when you consider that over the last two years, the years where Johnson has really been a a big part of what they're doing, Ben Roethlisberger has been one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL, both in terms of being able to push the ball and in terms of accuracy. And so, yeah, the, I, I mean, the, the rookie I, quarterback is a problem, but it wouldn't be a problem. It's not the same problem as it would be if Johnson actually had been getting great quarterback play. Right. This is the one where I think there's still a clear upside case for Deontay Johnson. If there's a player that's a Cooper Cup of this year, it might be Deontay Johnson for, for me in the sense that, He's shown the targets per outrun ability to earn all this volume. People talk about how inefficient he is. He's been very inefficient after earning targets. His yards per target have been terrible. But how much of that is quarterback play? How much of that is his complete inability to be efficient? Because efficiency is not super predictive, right? We know he has some drops issues. We know that there's going to be some things that maybe limit him. But if, if he gets any kind of improvement in quarterback play that allows him to be an 8.5 yards per target guy, a nine yards per target guy, which I was just saying, even like a Keenan Allen in his prime was that if he can have a season where he's a nine yards per target guy and he's earning targets on 27% of his routes, which he did last year, 
I mean, this I'm still talking about Deontay Johnson here. This, that's a great profile. That's a first to second round profile. That's a bet I kind of want to make because he's shown this targets per outrun ability. You go back to his college numbers. I was looking at college targets per outrun earlier this offseason. And in every season he was in college, he had really strong ability to earn targets per round. So people want to talk about, oh, he was just Ben's favorite guy. I don't know. I think this guy was just is just somebody who's a very good route runner and earns volume, as you said. We haven't seen the efficiency at the NFL level, but if we can see that for one year, that's that's the Cooper Cup kind of breakout year, I think. And then you I'm look, not saying he's going to be Cooper Cup. No one's going to be Cooper Cup this year. <laughs> you say that, but Colum gets final say on what the title is, and it sounds like it's going to be Ben claims Deontay Johnson is 2022 Cooper Cup. <laughs> so look at these next couple of guys, Ben, that I think have to kind of be paired together because they have some similarities to their profile. And the main thing is they both have terrible quarterback play and were wildly disappointing last year. That's Terry McLaurin and DJ Moore. Those two players rank fifth and sixth in terms of fantasy relevant wide receivers coming back this year in air yards. But there is a subtle difference, and maybe it's really not subtle, in terms of how they're getting there. McLaurin being targeted 13 yards down the field, more only 11 and that also translates into more having about 1.5 more targets per game. And in any time you have those two profiles, you prefer the guy who's getting more targets per game. That gives him a better floor. It also gives him the ceiling element. It means that even with poor quarterback play, he's more likely to convert some more of those air yards. You look at the guys, and they're two of the worst elite wide receivers in terms of racer but McLaurin is going to be the player that it's harder for him to really claw that back without a massive improvement at quarterback. And I guess I don't know that Carson Wentz is that guy. We also know that the Carolina Panthers <laughs> could have disastrously poor quarterback play again with Sam Darnold or Matt Corral. I think there's this dream scenario where Corral becomes a quarterback that is fun and works with these guys. Robbie Anderson, someone I think, an interesting very late target in this kind of series because his 2020 target profile was so interesting. But if we look at just very straightforwardly, Washington has added players to take even more of this superficially appealing target profile away from McLaurin where Moore is going to have his. So I think there's probably a bigger gap between these guys than what ADP indicates. Yeah, you're not going to get a complaint from me, and I think you put that very well. McLaurin, from a targets per run perspective, has never really been elite. He's been a guy who's run a ton of routes and been pretty efficient, has that high A dot. His, his targets per run is better when you consider that downfield A dot that you mentioned and gets all those air yards. But I'm with you that there's not – I mean, he, he could just catch more deep passes, but there's not a, a really a clear way that his profile over three years looks like it can improve. Moore's, we have four seasons now. The first three – this was a guy who showed really strong after the target efficiency yards per target, not touchdown rate. Obviously that's the big thing with DJ Moore. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep saying every single off season, I think he has an eight touchdown season in him. I don't think it's that crazy, um, but he was at least nine, nine yards per target each year over 10 twice, both as a rookie and as a third year player in 2020 those are really strong yards per target numbers. Uh, part of you know the 2020 season was his ADOT was higher. They're treating this more of a deep threat. But part of this is a, is a yak ability. And it also shows, if you look back to even his rookie year, a little bit more earlier in his career, when they used him on some handoffs, he had some really strong rush efficiency. This guy's good with the ball in his hands, right? That's something that was a part of his profile in college. His past year, though, his yards per target fell all the way to 7.4. Easily a career low. The targets per out run jumped way up to a career high. I mean, this is sort of similar to, we, we kind of skipped over DK Metcalf, but a similar thing where they're coming off years where the targets per out run actually spiked to a really strong level. The yards per target looks worse, but they had multiple seasons of, of efficiency that showed that they can be better than that. Efficiency is going to jump around year to year. But like when I project DJ Moore, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to project him at 7.4 yards per target when he has three seasons of nine or better. Prior to that, I'm going to project him, you know, at least at 8.5 or something. If you if you can maintain the target rate, if, if Robbie Anderson doesn't have this good season that you alluded to potentially having, and if the quarterback play can help him to any type of, you know, 
rebound in yards per target. The blow up season for him is still there too. And you mentioned DK Metcalf. He's a player who, if he hadn't scored all of those touchdowns last season, people would be even much more worried about this change at the quarterback position. And so I, I was interested in how the quarterbacks had influenced him last year. I pull up the game splits app and I see that he actually averaged over 17 points per game with Gino, just under 14 with Russell Wilson. And so I'm thinking, well, there are probably some more fun visuals we can pull out of the tools then and load up the adjusted yards per attempt tool. But this is this is kind of funny, right? Last season with Gino, 15 adjusted yards per attempt when he targeted <laughs> Metcalf. Russell Wilson, seven. On the flip side of that, Tyler Lockett over just like the slightest hair under 11 AYA with Wilson down there at five with Gino, much more like we would expect. So a couple of things that pop out here. Number one is that the splits for Metcalf are hugely fluky. And that's something to keep in mind anytime that you're looking at something like the game splits tool is that sometimes what you think is giving you some really valuable information in terms of, okay, this guy's upside in a better situation is separate. Sometimes that's going to be fluky as well, but we're not expecting him to be better with Geno Smith or heaven forbid drew lock. But it does kind of raise the question of he's more insulated from change in QB play than Tyler Lockett. They're being drafted in very different places. And the two main reasons I would think are going to be age and size. Those things are relevant as we look at how these guys are, are likely to play going forward in the red zone and, and some other things. Tyler Lockett, that vertical threat that needs the elite downfield passer. Thoughts on these two guys? I mean, is DK Metcalf someone who is so good that you're actually going to get a little bit of a discount here because of the quarterback and you should take it? I think drafters have that part right that you just said, that there should be a gap and DK should be higher, but they have been close in scoring the last few years and the gap might be a little wider than it should be. Metcalf, I just sort of alluded to, was really interesting that he actually, he was sort of in this average targets per out range, sort of similar to the Terry McLaurin thing I was saying a moment ago with strong yards per target to carry, you know, the lack of, you know, monster target numbers in his first two seasons. But then last year he has a targets per out run up around 25%, uh, about five percentage points higher than his sophomore year, which was his previous career high. And then his yards per target really kind of cratered. And you talked about how, you know, he, he had a little bit more scoring with Gino. And, and I'm with you. That's just sort of a, a funny note. But he did play some with poor quarterback play last year. You talk about what was different about 2019 and 2020 in terms of his efficiency. Well, he mostly played with Russell Wilson throughout those two seasons. Last year he played with both. And it is, you know, he, part of him playing with Russ last year was Russ was hurt still when he came back, right? His hand was still healing, I think, uh, is fair enough to say. He was missing a lot of throws that you don't really expect from Russell Wilson. But la the point is, is like if you're already discounting DK Metcalf because he can't be as efficient with worse quarterbacks, that's what we sort of saw last year, and yet he still had a pretty good year. He's still better than where he's being drafted this year. Now, a large part of that was just the touchdowns, right? And then he scored 12, I think, last year. Does he score 12 more this year? That's pretty tough to, to imagine. But I'm with you in this idea that he's a guy who's just, you know, a, a grown-ass man, as we say. He's a guy that can get his sort of – regardless of the quarterback, if they put it up for him, he's going to make those plays. And so seeing him actually show this ability to be a little bit more of a target dominant player while the efficiency dropped off last year, I think is sort of promising. If he can maintain that, or at least some of that, he's not a bad pick in this range.